Welcome to the final workshop of Code Break, Winter 2016. Really excited to have you all here. Um, as with last time, I do have the live comments up on my screen um, directly in front of me, so if you do have any questions, uh, feel free to, um, to send in you know, whatever questions you want in the live chat. I will be able to answer them with about 30 second latency because of the internet. Um, so in this workshop, we're gonna be talking a little bit about game design. Um, and basically the idea behind this workshop is to figure out how do we make games that are fun? Um, how do we make games that are exciting and, and interesting and that people want to play? Um, what are some of the things that, that we can do as programmers, um, largely, because this is code break um, and uh, I expect that most of you are programmers, what are some of the things that we can do to make sure that the projects that we make are the most fun um, that they possibly can be? I will warn you ahead of time, I have made a few games myself. Um, I have spent a lot of time working with students making games. I've talked with a lot of people in the game industry, um, but I've never you know, shipped a, a AAA title or anything like that. So um, you know, with regards to any advice that I give you in this, um, your mileage may vary, I think is the, is the term there. Um, I'm gonna try to give you an overview of some things that you might wanna think about when you're, you're working on your games. Um, obviously it's the very end of Code Break, so Maybe some of this will be more useful for the next code day um, or the, you know, the next code break um, because this has certainly gone quite well. Um, but with that in mind, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to give you some things to think about um, and some, some general ways of looking at games that, that might be a little bit more helpful um, as you start planning out your, um, you know, your future plans for, uh, for upcoming games that you might want to work on. So with that in mind, go ahead and switch over to the computer and uh, go through this. So game design. Um, again, our goal with this is to try to figure out how do we make something that is fun and exciting and that people want to play? Um, how do we make something that is not just technically you know, challenging, but something that the end result is something that people actually have fun using? Um, and that's something that not a lot of people get right. Um, one of the most common things that I see at Code Day um, is that a game has really a lot of potential, but there's just a few things that people have, have gotten wrong. Um, you know, not to blame them or anything because Code Day is a 24-hour event. It's not the biggest deal, but, um, you know, a lot of the times the games that people work on could be a lot more fun if they had just taken a little bit more time um, to work on some of the smaller parts of it. So I'm going to go through some of the things that you might want to think about when you're, you're designing your game. Um, some things that some of them are going to be really early on, some of them are going to be later stage. Um, for those of you who are working on games, maybe some of them will be useful for you um, later on in the presentation. For those of you who work on a game at a future code day um, or another future event, just for fun, for yourself, whatever, um, some of the earlier things might be helpful. Um, so we're going to start off by just talking about like one of the major concepts that makes a game fun. Um, and in my opinion, one of the major things that makes a game fun is that the player can have a meaningful influence on something that um, something in the in the game. That is kind of to me one of the core concepts of of gameplay. Um, so, what does it mean to have a meaningful influence? Uh, one, the player can make choices, uh, and two, the player knows of the choices that they could make, what choices they want to make, and then three, that there's some sort of relation between a cause and effect. So, the player sees a choice that they can make they are eventually able, maybe not initially, you know, maybe there's a learning curve, but they are eventually able to figure out what choice they want to make. And then there is some relation between that choice that they made and something that happens in the game. Um, all of these sort of things, the choices that players make, are generally pretty tied in with what you would call game mechanics. Um, there are some exceptions to games that don't necessarily have these these traits. One of the major ones that I think of is there are certain card games that are entirely random. Um, if you think of a lot of the games that people play in casinos, most of those there is absolutely no choice that the player is making other than to play. Um, and I think that there are certainly some problems with that particular use case, but um, it is possible to make a game where people don't have meaningful influence. There's also increasingly a, you know, a category of games that just have, um, are basically sort of a linear walkthrough and you can't really influence anything. Um, really obvious one there would be uh, Dear Esther. Esther, I, I'm not actually sure how to pronounce that name, but it is, you know, what would people would call a walking simulator. 
and oftentimes those are fun too. Um, so, you know, again, everything here is, uh, you can take it or leave it, but in most games, what you want to think about is what are the, what are the aspects of your game where the players can make choices? And then what we're trying to do is we're optimizing around making sure that the player knows what choices they want to make and then figuring out how that should affect the world. And we'll talk a little bit more in detail because I know this is kind of fuzzy, but before we even start talking about some of the more detailed ways that you could implement some of these things, let's just talk about some basic ways to test some, some of the basic game mechanics. Because like I was saying, most of the players being able to have a meaningful influence aspect of games um, is driven from your game mechanics. And those are the things that you decide that you want to, to do. So when I say game mechanics, I say, you know, I mean, for example, uh, Braid is a, a game about time travel. And a lot of the game mechanics in Braid are related to time travel. So there's one world, for example, in which as you move from left to right across the screen, time progresses. If you move from right to left, it goes backward. If you stay in one spot, time is frozen. In another level, there's a ring that slows down time in a certain area. Uh, in another, another level, you can go forward or backward in time. So all of those things are, are sort of game mechanics. All of those things are things that you would want to um, you know, potentially test and see, okay, is this confusing? Does the player understand what, what they can do with this mechanic? Um, is the player making choices that, that seem to make sense in the way that I want them to? Those are all game mechanics. Overwatch has you know, many game mechanics because they have the major you know, shooting things, but then they also have a lot of other things that sort of all come together in various ways. And so there's have some major game mechanics and a bunch of really tiny detailed ones that you could consider as their own mechanics. Um, all of those things are things that we generally want to test. So what are some of the ways that we can test the core concepts of our game before we get into programming? That's what I'm going to talk about right now. I know most of you at Codebreak are probably way past this point because the last day is tomorrow, but what are some of the things that maybe for next time, before you even get into programming the game, what are some of the ways that you could test, is this even a fun idea? Is this even something that I should be doing? One of the first ways that uh, a lot of people will test games, and this is something that I teach a high school class uh, in the morning as sort of a volunteer thing, and uh, one of the things that my students do when they're doing uh, games, one of the things I have them do beforehand is make a paper prototype. Um, paper prototype, the idea is to kind of build like a very basic board game that tests some of the really important or new game mechanics. So what does that mean? You know, how do we test something that's on a computer is very interactive, um, but, you know, how do we test that in a board game-like format? Well, that sounds a little bit weird, right? So let's, let's get a little bit more detailed there. Um, first of all, we're only testing important or new game mechanics. So if we're building a platformer and the goal of the platformer is to be able to manipulate physics, which is something that I did recently, we don't need to test the platforming aspect. We know platformers are something that people are okay with. Not worried about that at all. What we would be worried about then is the ability to manipulate physics. So maybe what I would do is I would have a turn-based game where players would be able to each turn either move or you know, cast a physics spell on an object. That might be an example of a way to make a paper prototype for a physics-based game because we're not trying to test the basic mechanics that, that we, we already know. We're trying to test, is it fun to be able to do this particular thing that's new? If we were doing something like Braid, maybe we would have the ability to, um, you know, have enemies move in some predictable way, and there's a, you know, every turn you move, and then you move the enemies in this predictable way, except if you move backward, you move them backward in this predictable way. Is that kind of fun? Can you build a basic level that's fun? The goal is not to build your entire game with paper prototypes. The goal is not to test the entire game. The goal is to try to figure out, are these mechanics that I've come up with actually something that are fun? Is this something that will actually make an enjoyable gameplay experience? Now again, we're not trying to test everything, and also one thing to keep in mind is when I say testing, I actually don't really necessarily mean we're trying to prove that it is fun, which is what I've been saying. With all of these sort of pre-making things, with all these things we're trying to do before we make the game, what we're actually trying to do is disprove that the game is fun. We're trying to find ways in which the game is not fun. Um, we are trying to make sure that before we waste a bunch of time 
making a game, we don't waste a bunch of time making a game that's not fun. I've done that before. I have, um, I was making a game when I was in high school based around the concept of asteroids um, combined with Minesweeper. So you were sweeping a minefield and it was kind of the, the combination of those two games. We spent a lot of time building the entire game. We had art, we had a fully working physics engine which had been coded from scratch, all sorts of really cool stuff. Um, we built the game, turned out it was just really, really, really not fun at all. And that was something that we could have tested early on. So we were actually trying to disprove it. Um, when you're talking about paper prototypes, it's generally you want to make it pretty simple because you're only trying to test a few game mechanics that are really important or new or innovative. It doesn't need to be super polished. Uh, it really, is, it's something for your own purpose. Important to note that it does need to be a game. It's not a demo. You're not trying to show how, you know, you move the enemies in a particular way. There needs to be, it is a game. There needs to be some way for you to win, some way for you to lose. Think of it as a really, really early prototype of a board game that you're going to turn into a game later. So it, it can't just be something where you show, okay, well, the player moves this way, and then the enemies move this way, and then the player moves this way, and then the enemies move this way. No, there needs to be some sort of goal when you're talking about paper prototypes, because you are trying to test whether this is fun. And then when you have a paper prototype, you can play it, you can give it to friends to play. If it's a multiplayer game, um, you could invite some friends over and play it together. But really, you're looking for a few different things. You're looking for one, is the difficulty correct? Oftentimes, too difficult is not as much of a problem as too easy. If, there, if the game is really, really, really easy and you can't figure out a way to make it more difficult, that's probably not going to be fun, and we'll talk about why later. Um, some other things you might look for, not necessarily, but you might look for, uh, do people make cost-benefit analysis? Um, oftentimes, for more complicated games, you're trying to, especially multiplayer games, you're trying to force players to be sort of competitive and they're supposed to make some sort of choice. So if you were building a paper prototype for StarCraft, you'd be looking for, are people deciding to sacrifice this one, um, you know, section of their army for this other game? Um, and, you know, I don't know how you'd make a paper prototype for StarCraft, you'd want to think about that a little bit, but, um, yeah. Uh, are there any emergent behaviors? Do players come up with something really interesting that they can do given this simple concept? So again, using the example of a game that I've been working on for a little while, a physics-based puzzle platformer, where you have to solve puzzles using, for example, gravity grenades that you shoot, and when they explode, everything in their radius has gravity negated. Um, another thing for friction, if you light the ground on fire, anything on that with a friction flamethrower, anything that's uh, caught on fire from that will have its friction reversed, so when you touch it, it will actually accelerate. Um, I made a paper prototype for that. What sort of interesting behaviors come out of that? What sort of, um, you know, what sort of new ways can I figure out of using those simple, basic concepts to come up with new and interesting ways of solving puzzles? Because that means that I'm going to have a lot of flexibility there, and it sort of gives me a really good artistic canvas for, you know, building a, a more fully featured game around that. Um, and then improvement, do players learn skills over time? Again, we'll talk about this, but it is important that players um, improve their skills and that we can continue to make it challenging, which ties back into difficulty. When you're talking about paper prototypes, you're usually talking about something that's supposed to save you time, so you usually want to try to make it uh, fairly quick. You don't want to have something that's going to be really, really, um, you know, you're not, you're not going to spend weeks and weeks on this. Ideally, you know, in, in a real game development studio, you might spend a week or two on a paper prototype. Um, in, um, in you know, your code day projects or your code break projects, you might skip this, um, but I, I would actually recommend, you know, try to figure out, like, 30-minute version, how can I make a really crappy thing to test our most core mechanic. Here's just a, a quick example I pulled. Um, Cornell has a class on uh, game design, and they have this example. Um, this is a game called Angry Bunny, and it uh, looks... It's kind of hard to see, perhaps, on the screen, but it's a it's a game, basically, where it's a four-player game. You play on a tablet. Each player controls, um, basically, kind of part of a character, and the net forces of all the players um, that are applied to this character can, can move it around. So their paper prototype was they have four different sections on the edge of the screen, and there's a bunch of strings tied to this one character. And all four players have to move the character around through the level, avoiding the red things, um, to get to the, the end goal using these four strings. And so each player has one string and they have to sort of work together to move the bunny around. You can sort of see how that would be 
an example of a paper prototype of a game that involves multiplayer controls um, moving one, one character. So that, that's a great example of how you can take you know, a, a complicated game and, and make it into something else. And again, they weren't testing lots and lots of things in this. They were testing that one particular mechanic of having four players all control the same player character. Um, another way that you can test your games maybe a little bit past the paper prototype stage or if you really don't want to do it um, is what we would call a spike solution. Um, a spike solution is just a, you know, a really quick throwaway project to test one particular thing or learn how to do one particular thing. Um, the screenshot that I have here is actually from um, a, an article called Game Feel Techniques. And the idea was this person was making a game, he wanted to understand how to control the player character. How should we do acceleration? And how does different acceleration affect different aspects of how the game feels? So for example, if you just have, whenever you hold down the left key, your player is immediately moving at one unit per second, that might not be as easy to control as if your player character ex gradually accelerates to one unit per second, and how fast do they decelerate, and all of those sort of things. So he was making a game where player controls were really important, um, and so he decided to just make a, a separate app, completely separate from his main game. I don't know, maybe his main game was even a 3D game. Who knows? He made a 2D game um, just with a bunch of different presets so that he could test different acceleration solutions. Um, with my game, with my game that was around physics-based puzzle platforming, I built a really, really basic version of the game to test out, first of all, how to implement some of the physics things, and second of all, was it even fun? Because again, paper prototypes go so far, but is it actually something that was fun? Um, so that's kind of, again, that's kind of the next step. You can kind of do this throughout development. Um, whenever you have a problem that you're not entirely sure how to solve, or whenever you have something where you're not sure if this is going to be fun, rather than spending a bunch of time integrating it into the game and finding out it's boring, it's usually better to try to just build something really quickly and see if it works. Um, the next step is something called white boxing. Um, there's also something called gray boxing, which is just white boxing, but with more detail. Um, white boxing, I think, comes from the idea that you could just make a game where all of your enemies are white boxes. Um, in this case, the example that I have is a game called Bastion, um, which is a really popular game from a while ago. It's a really great game. If you haven't tried it, I'd recommend it. The screenshot on the left is actually their first prototype of the game. And the screenshot on the right is what it actually looked like. So you can see that the screenshot on the left is a really, really crappy version um, it's got a lot of things that are missing. If you go and you can find videos of it online, it doesn't look very good. The player doesn't move very well. The enemies don't move very well. But it tested the major ideas of the game, and it was a, a an implementation of the game that just needed more work. Um, white boxing is at the point where you actually are starting to develop a game. So it's not a throwaway solution like a paper prototype or a spike solution. Um, with white boxing, you're actually starting to build the game, but what you're saying is, we're not going to worry about these really detailed features, we're going to worry about, again, getting the core game mechanics in as quick as possible to make sure that they're fun. Because having a beautiful looking game doesn't mean much if the game isn't at least moderately fun with just the core game mechanics. Um, so when you're making a game, you know, what are the really, really basic things that you can add into the game just to figure out, is this actually fun? Is this something that I want to play? Now, maybe you don't want to play it for, you know, a long time because it doesn't have a story, it doesn't have art, it doesn't have music, everything looks like crap, it's hard to figure out what's going on, but is this something that I want to play for even 10 minutes? Because if I don't want to play something for 5 or 10 minutes, it's probably not going to, I'm probably not going to want to play it for 5 or 10 minutes, even if it looks really beautiful. Again, not universally the case, but often the case. Um, and there are more examples of this as well, um, but Bastion does a really great job. Their later game uh, called Transistor, you can also find screenshots of the final version and their white box version. So again, white boxing is sort of starting to produce a final game. You're not going to throw it away. You usually take a white box version and you start just making it better. It's just focused on the core game mechanics. Once you start to have that game and you start to think about how do I actually go from this white box version to a more polished version, we'll start to get into some more things around game design. Um, one really important thing to think about at this point is the game loop. So game loop. Um, basically, the idea behind a game loop is you want to have goals, and the player should know what their goals are. Um, you want to give them a challenge, and then you want to provide them some sort of feedback. 
So you can see in this you know, particular example of a really early Mario game, you got Mario, he wants to get the, the you know, coin block, his challenges, he's got these little mushroom guys walking underneath him, he's got to you know, figure out how to do that without getting, getting killed. That's a really small scale goal. And we'll talk about you can have larger scale goals as well, but one of the cores of, of games is having that game loop constantly. That is what players are looking for. They're looking for a goal, there's a challenge, and then they get feedback on they did it right or they did it wrong. Let's talk about feedback really briefly. Um, feedback is important and it, it is really, really important to give players feedback to make it clear to them that they've done something right or they've done something wrong. Um, these are two screenshots from a really great talk called Juice It or Lose It, um, which is a GDC talk. You can find the video online. You can also play this game online. Um, the version on the left is just Pong. It's the most basic version of Pong. The ball hits something, the thing disappears, it bounces off. If it hits the paddle, it bounces back up. They actually don't have a lose condition in the game, so you, you don't have a limited number of lives, but um, the basic concept is there. The screenshot on the right, on the other hand, is the exact same game, but what they did was added a bunch of what they call juiciness. So whenever the ball hits a, um, a block, the block sort of explodes into confetti, the screen shakes a little bit, the ball's got this trail that goes behind it um, that just makes it look a little bit more exciting. Um, whenever something gets it gets exploded, it's got this little sound effect that's like something popping, and then there's like a yay! Um, the little paddle has eyes that just look at the ball. All of those are ways of providing feedback. All those are, are ways of telling the player, hey, you did something good. Feedback can do multiple things. Feedback can make it more clear to the player what their goals are. Um, but in, in the case of Pong, for example, this is a really simple case, people generally know they need to hit the, the bricks. Feedback can also make it more fun. Feedback makes the game loop something that you want to go through. Because again, the game loop, goal, challenge, feedback, you can continue to make the goal as obvious if you, as you want, but if, there's no, if players don't want to get to that goal, they're just going to quit the game. Plenty of games end that way, right? There are plenty of games that you try, and you're like, this is really boring. Providing feedback that makes the player excited to continue is something that's really important. And providing that feedback in multiple ways and at multiple, um, multiple scales. So, you know, obviously there's the grand goal of the game, but there's also smaller goals. And, and making it clear that whenever the player does something good, um, that that is something that is... Um, should continue to happen. And whenever the player does something bad, you know, make it really obvious that they've done something bad and that they should um, not do that again. Um, really great example of this in the real world is Fruit Ninja. Fruit Ninja is fundamentally a game about tapping things quickly. And if you tap and drag on things that are one color, um, you could, you know, you could think of this as a, a monochrome game. Uh, if you tap and, and drag on things that are green, then you win, you win. And if you tap and drag on things that are red, then you lose. That is a game. It's kind of fun on its own. You could imagine building that really simple game and having a little bit of fun. That's kind of Dance Dance Revolution, maybe. Um, you know, you have a bunch of things coming up on the screen and you do an action based on them. It's a, it's a genre of game. It's something that's been kind of proven. All that Fruit Ninja did was add really good feedback. Um, now, obviously, both of these are sort of arcade style games. How do you do feedback in other games? Well, there are definitely ways to do that. Um, We'll look at some examples um, in a little bit of uh, less arcade style games. Um, but uh, with any sort of game, especially with games you already play, think about what are, the, what are the types of feedback that I'm getting? What are the positive and negative feedback? Um, what happens when I kill an enemy or complete a level to, to make me feel like I've really accomplished something exciting, rather than just immediately jumping to the next level or the enemy just disappears? Most games, the enemy does not just disappear. There's a sound effect. Um, there's some sort of animation, so on and so forth. Um, we're talking about game loop, we're talking about we have a goal as well, right? Um, the goal types, there's a few different goal types. Um, there are micro goals, so you know, micro goals are just the really small things that are happening all the time. That's like in that example that I used, Mario wanting to get that block. There's oftentimes a more medium level goal. Um, in Mario that would be get to the end of the level. And then oftentimes there's a really macro goal, which is complete the entire game? What is the end goal of your game? All of those need to have their own sort of game loops that are running. The macro level goals constantly need to be reinforced. You need to be constantly making players aware that they 
you know, why is the reason that they want to get to the end of the game. But you also need to have these smaller game loops that are happening constantly so that people have fun. If you go too long between, you know, the, the goal, the challenge, and then the, the feedback, if you go too long before giving them that feedback, players are not going to have a good time. Um, it's just going to get really frustrating because they're going to feel like they're not making progress. They're not going to know how far away from the goal they are. And they're not going to feel like they're, they're doing a good job at the game. Um, on the other hand, if you're providing constant feedback, uh, you know, having those really small level game loops where people are training specific mechanics and they're getting better at specific mechanics and they're seeing that they're doing specific things well, they'll feel like they're making more progress. Um, again, so keeping loops as short as possible is also important. In addition to having those micro scale loops, um, having really, really quick game loop cycles. Um, this is a game called Super Meat Boy. It's a really great game if you haven't tried it. Uh, it's a strange game as well. Um, it's also by the guy who made Binding of Isaac. Uh, Super Meat Boy is a game about uh, not entirely sure, saving a woman who's made of bandages uh, and you are made of meat. But the gameplay of the game works such that there are, again, there's the longer term goal of saving the bandage girl. There are the shorter term girls and the goals in that there are a bunch of worlds. But then each individual level is very, very brief. If you die in the level, you restart the level. You can restart the level as many times as you want. It even provides you with some additional feedback in that certain, you can see in this case, there are a bunch of uh, saws that are covered in blood. That's because you've hit them in the past. Um, and you had to, you died and you restarted, and then they continue to be covered in blood. So you can see, oh hey, this is where I w died before, and you can feel like you've made progress because you've gotten a little bit further. Additionally, whenever you die, the levels are so short that it, it doesn't feel like you've lost a lot of progress. It feels like, hey, I'm just going to try something else. There are some levels that are longer in Super Meat Boy, and oftentimes those are the ones that people found really frustrating. Um, those are the ones that I found frustrating and many other people that I've talked to who've played the game found frustrating. Most of the levels are very, very, very short. Um, you can see in this case almost the entire level. So you can see how it's really not a particularly long level. If you die near the end, you, um, you know, might lose maybe a few seconds. Um, one other thing to mention on this point, story, when we're talking about setting those goals, short-term, long-term goals, um, story is a little bit important because story guides the player into the game loop. Story makes it clear what the goals are. Um, again, obviously the shorter term goals are obviously more apparent, um, but if you have longer term goals, it is usually somewhat important to have at least a very minimal story. It doesn't need to have very many details, it can just be a beginning, middle, and end. Um, it's really, really, really hard to make games that are fun without even a very minimal story. Um, now again, story is not on its own something that is going to solve your problems. I did not recommend starting with story, if you remember. Um, I recommended starting with having a game concept and figuring out how that works, and the story should be something that helps the player understand what their longer term goals are. It's, it should be something that helps with the game. It doesn't define the game on its own, usually. Again, there are exceptions. Um, but that said, completely foregoing a story usually does not work. There are very, very few successful pure sandbox games. Very, very few successful pure sandbox games. And even Minecraft you can think of, which is probably the most successful sandbox game, does have um, some instances of a story, right? You can think of immediately if a new player joins the, the thing, what are the things that he's going to try to do? Well, he's going to try to survive the night. That's kind of a story aspect, right? And then he's going to, as part of surviving the night, he's going to need to build a base. And then oftentimes, making the base really cool becomes kind of the story. Um, now, obviously there's a lot of story in Minecraft that is just derived solely from the sandboxness of it, but there are certain aspects of the game that need to be conveyed really, really quickly to make it clear what the goals are. And those things are, you need to survive, and you need to build um, cool things. And both of those things are sort of created by this really initial story where when you join the game, it gives you this little thing that says you need to break a tree to, to get wood. And you get a, you know, there's this achievement tree that you learn early on. They did add a full story later, which is a little bit weird. The game does have an ending now, um, which I guess is not news to anyone, but someone who played Minecraft really early on, it was news to me. But 
Um, even way, way before that, they did have the achievement system that sort of guided players through the very, very early levels of the game so that there was something that they felt like they were moving toward. It's a super basic, it's not even really a story, but it does have a beginning, middle, end. Um, and you, you kind of have to have that for, for almost anything. It's very difficult to do it without it. Lots and lots of games have tried, most of them have failed. Um, really good example recently is No Man's Sky, which is a game that had basically no story, just a really overarching story, and it turns out it's actually really boring, um, which is why it sort of has flopped. Um, so, okay, so we've gone into story, we've gone into game loop. One other thing that's really important to keep in mind when it comes to video games is something that we call flow. Um, basically, and you can think of this as programming, in programming as well, oftentimes in programming, you get into this sort of state where for at least a while, once you get good at programming, for at least a while, you don't really have too many problems, you don't have too many bugs, and you start to make a bunch of progress. That's kind of the same thing with video games. Um, if you think of video games as a chart where on the, the y-axis you have uh, difficulty and on the x-axis you have time, I think I, did I get that right? Opposite way, maybe? I don't remember which way charts work anymore. It's been a while since I took a math class in high school. Um, you can think of it as those, those sort of two axes. As the player progresses through time, as they move through your video game, they start to get better and better skill-wise. And as a result, if you were to just continue to make the levels equally as difficult, at some point the levels would become way too easy for them. Now on the other hand, if you make the levels way too difficult too early, they're going to be so difficult that the player is never going to solve them, they're not going to learn the skills that they need to solve them, and they're going to quit and give up. So you can see on the left I have an example of a chart of just, you know, if you just made a, a hundred level game and you just ordered the levels completely randomly, the chart on the left is basically what you would get. And in fact, at Code Day, oftentimes this is the most common problem I see from teams, is they will make a bunch of levels and they'll just order them and they won't give too much thought to what order they're in. And so the first level will be way too difficult and the second level will be way too easy. Um, in fact, even at the very last Code Day that I went to, um, in the demo, the first level that they had in the demo, it took people about three minutes of the five minute presentation time to solve that one level. Um, and then the second level, you didn't actually have to do anything. If you just hit the fire button immediately, the level would be solved. Those levels should probably be reordered. If you get it right, you get something like the graph on the right. And again, these are unitless. Um, you know, there's not an objective way to track this. Um, we'll talk about some of the more objective ways, but there's not really a, a totally objective way to track this, but if you make your game such that as the player progresses in skill, they stay out of the too difficult or too easy range, they get in what's called flow, which is the part of a game where it's really fun. You've probably experienced this if you play video games. Um, it's the part of the game where you're not really stuck. You know, it, There's oftentimes that one part in the game where you've been making a lot of progress, you've been having a lot of fun, and then there's this one battle where you can't seem to take down this boss. And you try and you try and you try, and then you get really frustrated, and that's when you go and eat food because you know you haven't eaten since um, 9 a.m. and it's it's 5 p.m. You know that's the point where you actually stop playing the game. Flow is the entire state in between that, and that's because the game was the right level of difficulty for you. Um, some games mess with this a little bit more than others. Um, we'll talk about that, but in general, um, most games are fun when they're not too difficult or not too easy. Um, unless you're really into playing the incredibly difficult games, which do exist. Um, here's an example that's a little bit hard to see, so I'll show you a zoomed-in version in a second, but this is actually an example of a chart of um, skills that players learn in Portal 2 um, that this awesome guy whose name is at the bottom created. Um, just created this. He doesn't work for Valve. He just created this to track it. But all of the orange dots are new skills that you learn, like fundamental skills, like how to avoid the toxic water, how to use the you know one portal, how to use both portals, all of those things are orange dots. And then gray dots are different ways of using the skills that already exist. So all of the gray dots are, are things that you can do where you know maybe you've learned how to shoot two portals already and now you can make holes in a wall. Well, gray dot would be something like, oh hey, and also if you shoot a portal on the floor and you shoot a portal on the wall, you move out of it more quickly. Um, those are examples of the gray dots, um, and oftentimes the gray dots will also take multiple skills and combine them together. So you've learned how to shoot portals, you've learned about um, you know, the toxic water, now we're going to figure out how we can combine those two so that you can learn how to use portals to get over the toxic water. 
Um, you've learned about uh, weighted storage cubes, and you've learned about portals, and now you can learn how to use the two together. You've learned about buttons, and you've learned about weighted storage cubes, and now you can you know, figure out how to use those two together. Um, that would be what we'd call recombination. Um, and the idea is using existing skills in new ways um, and using them with new skills that you've, you've learned in the meantime. Um, it's important to have those sort of things as well because those, those are different ways of pushing the players to learn new things. Um, you can also kind of see the, the flow chart, right? We're talking about flow as like, you can see it as that sort of corridor in the previous slide, right? There's that sort of corridor of not too difficult, not too easy, and it turns out that it kind of moves in a line. If you look at this, these things kind of move in a line. Right? They kind of move in a line all the way down, and it, it, you're not introducing too many new skills too early on, except in the very first level, but you know, that kind of makes sense. It's the tutorial level. Um, and here's a zoomed in version if you wanted to see a little bit more. Here are some examples. Um, you know, the first level you learn grab, portals, weighted storage cube, heavy duty storage, uh, super colliding, super button, and the uh, emancipation grill. And then in the next level you learn switches, and then in the next level you learn uh, panels. Uh, and toxic water, and then the next little level you learn momentum, so on and so forth. Um, you can find this online, again, if you search for this guy's name, um, or just portal uh, skill chart, you should be able to find it. Um, another aspect that's kind of related to flow that's important to keep in mind is something that um, a book called The Design of Things proposed, um, which is a really cool book, I'd recommend it. Uh, it's called Affordance, is what they call it in the book. Um, the idea being people should know generally how things work. So if you look at the example on the right, the uh, pedestal button and the heavy duty super colliding super button from Portal, it's really obvious what you're supposed to do with them. People know what they're supposed to do with them and you don't need to teach them what to do with them. Um, the example on the left is actually one of my favorite board games. Um, it's called Twilight Struggle. It is one of my favorite board games, but to learn to play Twilight Struggle requires reading a rule book that is basically written like the tax code and the first game that you play of Twilight Struggle will usually take somewhere between four to six hours, and it's a two-player game. And the four to six hours is solely because you need to learn all of the different aspects of strategy, all of the different aspects of how the game works. Really nothing about that game is intuitive. Now, sometimes that can work. Twilight Struggle makes it work, because that's what makes Twilight Struggle interesting. But, at the same time, most people don't like Twilight Struggle. If Portal made everything in the game really difficult to understand, it would not be the Portal that you know and love, it would be a different game. There are a few things in Portal that, you, that are not intuitive, and that you do need to understand. Things like momentum, um, and how momentum is conserved through Portals are a really great example. But, everything that's not important to their core game mechanics are made as easy as possible to understand, so that they don't interrupt that flow. Because if you make everything really difficult, everything is constantly going to be too difficult. Players are constantly going to be struggling, and they never get into the point where they feel like they know what's going on, and that's important. Now again, there are some examples of games that can turn that on its head as part of the point of the game. Twilight Struggle is kind of one of them. I don't know if it was the point, but it is why a lot of people like it. It's why I like it. Um, this is a game called I Want to Be the Guy, if any of you have seen this game. Um, it's a really interesting game. Uh, if anyone has not played this game, you might think that the apples were good for you, because in most games, shiny red fruits are something that give you life. In this case, the apples will kill you <laughs> immediately, uh, make you have to restart the entire level. Um, and in fact, the apples will fall on your head if you walk under them. And in fact, almost all the apples will fall on your head, except one of them which will fall in reverse. It will fall up, um, and I think one of them falls sideways. So there are, uh, this is a game that really does turn that on its head, and its core game mechanic is you have no idea what's going on with this game, and it's going to be incredibly difficult, and you have to be the sort of person who's into that. And there aren't very many people who are into that sort of thing. Now, if you're making a game for those people, that's fine, but you really need to be explicit that this is a core game mechanic. I Want to Be the Guy is very explicit that it's a core game mechanic. Nothing in the game world is predictable. Um, nothing in the game world works like you would expect, and that's their core game mechanic. You can't just be sort of, you know, lukewarm on this. You can't just be, yeah, some things are going to make sense and some things are going to be really confusing for no reason. People are just going to get frustrated. You're not building it for any one person. You need to build it for one person, you know, one type of person. Um, so how do you playtest these things? Well, you, first of all, you need to. You need to figure out if you've got the flow right. You need to do it with other people because if you design for yourself, it's going to be too hard. You know how to solve the levels. Other people don't. 
This is why people often mess up at code day because they try to design for themselves and then they understand how this level works, but no one else does. Um, there is a, another game that was derived from I Wanna Be The Guy. I think it's called I Wanna Be The Boshi. And uh, at one point, the guy who designed this, and it was supposed to be a, a harder version of I Wanna Be The Guy for this guy named Boshi who complained that I Wanna Be The Guy is too easy. And um, at one point, the guy who made I Wanna Be The Boshi made a jump that was frame perfect, meaning you had to hit the jump button on exactly the right frame and there are 60 frames per second. And if you didn't hit the jump button on exactly the right frame, you would die every single time. It turned out that when he made that jump, he happened to do it perfectly the first time, so he just figured it was okay. Um, and for everyone else, it's one of the most difficult parts of the game. So that is something to keep in mind. You, you really do need to play test with other people. If you just are testing for yourself, it's gonna be too hard. Um, when you're talking about play testing, um, you're talking about um, gathering data. Um, so you're talking about there are two different ways of doing that. Subjectively, you can ask players about frustrating points. You want to be a little bit clear about what sort of questions you're asking. You don't want to just ask them, was that frustrating? Um, because oftentimes that won't give you as much useful data as you would hope. Um, <clears throat> instead, asking people more generic questions like, how did you feel when playing? What were your thoughts when dot dot dot? Um, don't always follow people's suggestions. People will have lots of suggestions. Most of them will be wrong. Try to understand why they suggested it. Um, don't just follow suggestions blindly or you'll end up in a, a spiral of people giving you uninformed advice on how you should do things and they're really, they really don't know any better than you and in fact they often know much worse than you what it is that you should be doing. Um, so ask them really open-ended questions trying to get that data. More objectively, if you can uh, collect data if you can collect actual data about the, the playtime of your game. Um, completion time per level, for example, is a really good one. Um, you know, uh, how long does it, if, you, if your game is broken into levels, how long does it take for you to get from, you know, the beginning of the level to the end? You could track the number of deaths in a level if someone dies a large number of times. That's probably a bad sign. Um, you could track something as simple as the x-coordinate maximum over time because for most games, the goal is to get to some objective. If it's a platformer game, you're trying to get to the end of the screen. Um, so if you just simply track the position of the player versus um, the goal, you know, the distance between those two, um, are there certain points in the level where it stays relatively static for a really long time? Do they make a lot of progress and then suddenly stall for a really long time, not make any progress, and then make a lot of progress again? So you could track things like that. Those are some of the more objective ways of figuring out where are some parts where people are getting frustrated. Um, so you can do that as well. Um, and then the final thing that I wanted to, um, to mention, and this is kind of the end of the presentation here. Finally, I wanted to mention is when you're designing games and when you're doing these play tests, it is really important to try to decide on who your audience is. Trying to make a game for everyone will not work. I've seen people, especially with the class that I teach, I've seen people try to describe the target audience for our game is, you know, beginners who've never played any games before. Our target audience also includes people who are hardcore gamers, people who are Twitch streamers, old people who've, who are not really into video games, but we want to get them into video games, um, you know, CEOs, uh, you know, it, they'll, they'll literally describe every aspect of the population so that the entire world is their target audience for their game. And you might think, hey, that's great. I have a lot of potential to make money there because the entire US could buy my game. Very occasionally, it's, it's advantageous to have a large target mo market, but usually that's the case when the large target mar market is still very homogenous. So for example, if you're like Microsoft, you're probably gonna make a lot of first-person shooters because there are a lot of gamers who like first-person shooters, but they're not targeting those to the entire US. Even though they do make a lot of money and a lot of people have played you know, Gears of War or Halo, there are still a large percent of the population that don't, and they know that those people are never gonna play it, and that's okay with them. If you make a game that is for everyone, no one is going to like it. Or sorry, no one is gonna love it. A lot of people might kind of like it, but you don't need a lot of people to kind of like it to sell games. You need a few people who love it enough that they're going to give you money, or they're going to download it. Um, you know, if it's free, they, they still need to download it. There's a certain barrier that you need to get over, where you need to make a game that enough people are going to love 
that they will actually want to download it and potentially give you money for it. So when you're talking about playtesting, when you're talking about all of these things, figuring out your core mechanics, figuring out how difficult it is, um, all of those sort of things, the most important thing for me is to try to figure out who is it that you're making this game for. And it's okay if you just say, I'm making this game for people like me. That's totally cool. But just be explicit about that. Don't try to make a game that's for everyone. Um, so with that, that's pretty much the end of uh, my presentation on game design. Again, I, I was just hoping to give you some things to think about. Um, any of these things, uh, as with all of the presentations in Codebreak, are things that you could Google a lot more um, to get a lot more data, a lot more information, a lot more thoughts, and a lot more detailed thoughts. A um, few resources that you might want to check out. Uh, game of Sutra is a, a weblog online where a lot of famous um, game programmers have written a lot of their thoughts. Um, they have some really great postmortems about famous games and how they did it. Um, and then also GDC, um, the Game Developers Conference. A lot of their videos are on YouTube. They have some really great ones if you go through their channel um, that are just talks with very famous game designers about um, both how they solve particular problems, um, either technically or game design-wise, as well as postmortems of uh, some really successful games and uh, how they came to be. So those are those are two resources that you might want to check out as well. Um, and uh, it does seem like there's a pretty big community online. Uh, so with that, if there are any questions, uh, feel free to post them in the chat. I will take just a few seconds um, while I wait for the, uh, the chat to catch up, um, just because of the lag. In the meantime, um, switch back to this. In the meantime, I will say as well, um, thank you all so much for participating in this code break. It's been wildly successful beyond anything that we imagined. We thought maybe five or six people would participate. It was orders of magnitude higher. Um, so we are definitely gonna be doing this again. We will try to come up with more workshops. If there are any workshops that you would like to see, um, please do let us know. Um, you can either post them in the chat now or send me an email, post them on Slack, anything you'd like. Um, we would love to do more workshops in the future. Um, next code break will probably be in the summer. Um, we're thinking of doing something in the summer and giving a little bit more interaction with mentors. So keep an eye out for that. Um, the other two videos are also recorded on this channel from these code break workshops. Feel free to check those out. Um, there are some historical workshops we've done as well. And uh, if you have any other questions, feel free to get in touch. Um, you know, there's always the Slack. You can email us at contact at srnd.org. Um, and I'm on Twitter at, at Tyler Menezes, which is difficult to spell, M-E-N-E-Z-E-S. So if you want to follow me on Twitter, go for it. Um, feel free to ask me questions there as well. So thank you all so much for participating in this online workshop. And uh, thank you for participating in Code Break. Have a good one. Oh, wrong.